I am very happy to be back in Chemnitz. I have been invited a number of times to speak here by Arne and also Professor Max Eibel. And I always enjoy my visits. The first time, I think, was in 2011 uh, for the keynote of the Mensch und Computer conference at which I spoke about user experience in science fiction, movies, and television over the past 100 years. That lecture is now an e-book, and I am happy to send it to you free of charge if you be sure to give me your email address. And somewhere there is a piece of paper floating around where you can sign up, at least with your email address. Print carefully, please, so I can read it and type the correct email address to send you that gift and also <coughs> some other documents which I can provide. I will say just a few minutes, uh, <coughs> speak a few minutes about my company. Mm. That looks a little pale, but I guess you can still see it. And what we have been doing for 37 years to design user experiences for many different people, many different platforms, many different vertical markets and subject matter. I'm sure you know some of these brand names of our clients like Siemens, Daimler, eBay, Samsung, Nokia, Motorola, and so on over the past more than 30 years. My own background was in physics first, that I studied, and then graphic design at an art school. Since then, I founded the company in 1982. We have won a number of awards. I've published about 30, 33, actually now, uh, publications, books that I've edited or co-edited, written, or co-written. We've identified six user experience spaces where new products and services can develop. Here are some of the publications that I've uh, made over the years. Here are some of our clients, <clears throat> and you may recognize some of their logos. Since we are limited in time, I'm going to stop right there. and move to our subject matter. I will try to make sure that you receive a handout uh, document, unless it's already been distributed. I don't know, Max, have you sent out anything about this? Yes? No, okay. So <clears throat> I will send you that, so you can just enjoy the show. If you have some uh, points which seem very uh, agreeable to you, you can let me know. If you want to argue about some of the points, write that down and we can discuss that later. <clears throat> A number of years ago, Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, was noted as a major contributor to anthropology. This was kind of a joke. But it was the case that in those early days, about 15 or more years ago, Microsoft was sending out anthropologists around the world to look at how people work, how people live, and how people use Microsoft products. Of course, it took them about 10 or 20 years to figure out that they should do that, but at least they were doing it. In the 1980s, when I went to SIGGRAPH conferences and CHI conferences around the world, there were anthropologists, but they were afraid to tell people that they were really anthropologists because they were not computer scientists. They were not 
real professionals. They were strange people from another discipline or world. Now in the last <clears throat> 10 years or so, anthropologists are much more important. They've been added to the teams of people who create new products and services. So it's recognized now that thinking about other people's cultures, ideas, values, symbols, can contribute to the success of a product or service. If you were going to make a new Microsoft product or any other <clears throat> company's product for US, China, Japan, and other countries, how would that product change? Well, you might, of course, think we have to change the language so people can read the screens. But it's deeper than that. And I'm going to try to show you all of the di different ways <clears throat> in which products and services might change. Here is a light switch. Even the idea of which direction the light switch is when it is on differs from country to country. A simple thing. How many of you would say in Germany, in Chemnitz, that the switch on the left would be up when the lights are on? Well, I think that's a half or a little more than half of the people, <clears throat> but not everyone. Some people think it would be the switch on the right. It was up, now you bring it down, and boop, the lights go on. Well, it differs in different countries. In the UK, in the US, in Germany, in China, in Japan, even a simple thing like which direction the light switches move might change from culture to culture. <coughs> I don't know if you have ever seen a movie called Black Robe. It was made in 1991 in Canada about a Roman Catholic priest, a French priest, in 17th century Canada who gets lost trying to find his way to some Native Americans to live with them, to try to convert them to Christianity. He travels with uh, a few other people. In the middle of the movie, suddenly he realizes, oh, the people I was with, they are gone. All I see around me are trees. Where are they? How am I going to survive? I don't know how to make a fire, how to cook food, even how to find food. There is nothing but trees around me. And he is so frightened, he falls down on his knees. He is praying to God, please, uh, I'm getting ready to die. Save me. Uh, uh, thank you for whatever you have given me in the past, and so on. As he is praying, his friends come back from the forest where they were wandering and see him there and say, what are you doing? I'm praying, I thought I was going to die. Thank you so much for coming back. And they are amazed at him because they say, well, well can't you see all the broken twigs where we were walking away? That's the path we took. And can't you see the direction of the sun? You know where the camp is from the orientation of the sun, <clears throat> later the, the moon and the, the stars. He knows nothing of how to read the environment. He knows many other things, but cannot survive in the simplest way. So for him, <clears throat> he is a complete foreigner or alien to the culture of the forest, to the Native Americans who are living there. When Barbie, Barbie dolls were introduced into China, <coughs> Mattel had to make some changes in their toy because the toy was not right for China. It assumed that all little girls want to play with Barbies and 
and that's it. No, little girls in China also want to study and get ahead and be smart. So they had to change the role of Barbie in toys for little girls. When you graduate from TUC in Chemnitz, does the university give you a little teddy bear? Oh, it's so cute, it's so sweet. At the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, I was there at graduation time, everyone had little teddy bears. There was even a store which sold the official university teddy bear so that everyone could hold the teddy bear and smile and have a photo taken for parents or friends. Do you do that in Chemnitz? I don't think so. <laughs> have you ever gone into a restaurant and eaten food that was still moving on your plate? We did in South Korea. Well, we didn't eat it. It was too disgusting for us, but it's a delicacy to eat a dying octopus that has been chopped up and killed, and you can watch it die on your plate, and you know it's fresh. <laughs> different people have different customs of what is tasty, desirable, familiar. Do you have a special holy day or a religious holiday in which you take powder of different colors and throw it onto your friends? I don't think so in Chemnitz, although maybe you do have such a strange custom. <clears throat> but in India, the Holi Festival does exactly that. In Berlin, there is, as you probably know, this long section of painted segments of the old wall that used to separate parts of Berlin, but that's fairly unusual. In Sao Paulo, in Brazil, <clears throat> there are whole areas uh, of the city where all the walls around the yards are decorated like you see here. In fact, Local artists come and paint over new paintings, as I think they do in Berlin, frequently. And you cannot even see where the doors are, uh, uh, where you get into the property, and so on. <coughs> and this is an accepted normal thing for this part of Brazil. It's not the same everywhere. My point is that modern technology the kind you are creating and studying, enables you to create products and services that go out everywhere, sometimes almost instantly. The challenges of good UX design, user experience design, are significant. You have courses in HCI to help you acquire those skills. But there's another <clears throat> kind of skill which increasingly people will need to have, and that is some awareness of culture differences and similarities which are created and studied through models of culture. We're going to look at a few of these in the time available. These differences affect all the metaphors, mental models, navigation, interaction, and appearance, the basic five elements of all user interfaces and they also affect information, visualization, and sonification. All the charts, the maps, the diagrams. So you have more to think about, more to study, but it is interesting, challenging, exciting, and important. As I mentioned earlier, there are these six basic spaces for user experience <coughs> Culture affects all of those spaces. You know about these development tasks, I assume, when you study them in HCI courses. All of those steps are affected by culture. All of this is a subset 
of a science called semiotics, the science of signs, here. And culture affects all of the tools that we make, all of the signs we make. It influences the shape of this bottle, the shape of this laser clicker, the shape of this phone. Whether we are aware of it or not, culture is acting to influence not only industrial design of three-dimensional objects, but sign design of all of the screens, all of the content, all of the metaphors and mental models that I mentioned earlier. Designers can be and should be aware of culture. It's not easy to be completely unbiased about culture. We are all raised in a culture. By the time that we are three or five years old, we are already part of a culture of our parents, our family, and our friends. You did not look at your parents when you were three or four years old, like my granddaughter is now, and say to your parents, why are you brainwashing me in German culture? I want to be something else. Did you do that? Well, maybe one or two of you had unusual childhood experiences and thought to say something like that, but most children accept the rules, the behaviors, the values, the customs, and assume, oh, that's how we are. That's whether we shake hands or bow, whether we use a fork or chopsticks. All of those things are set in place at a very early age. <clears throat> now, I'm going to take us on a little tour through differences of culture. One way to do this is to look at websites because it's easy to get access to them from around the world. But you can apply this to mobile phones, to VR, to other platforms of all kinds, augmented reality, and so on. Maybe you don't remember, but Daimler and Chrysler were once part of one company. Does anyone remember those days? <laughs> it didn't last very long. They were two different cultures, and they they didn't get along so well, so they split apart. While they were together, this was the website that, rec that represented them. Is it the right kind of website? Well, it's a nice royal blue, a Prussian blue, a very familiar color in Germany, somewhat uh, well known in the US, but much better known in Germany. And the two languages, German is on the left in the normal reading direction, and English is in kind of a backwards uh, arrangement, right justified. Still, it might have worked <clears throat> for both companies, but would not necessarily work in many other countries around the world. Many years ago, two international shippers, FedEx and DHL, <clears throat> all wanted to send packages to Saudi Arabia. At the time, DHL, here's the flag of Saudi Arabia to remind us the package is going to that location, and um, <clears throat> it showed men in white shirts and narrow ties uh, in an office, which is what you would typically see. No women. They weren't in Saudi Arabian offices working in general, like this scene of an electrical control room, probably. <clears throat> At that time, FedEx decided for some reason to show an Asian woman with her face uncovered, her arms bare, to show packages being sent to Saudi Arabia. Why would they have done that? They weren't trying to make a revolution. Today, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, is trying to make major changes in allowing women to drive and 
<clears throat> bringing in movies, et cetera, into Saudi Arabia, but this was decades ago. I think it appeared because FedEx just wasn't paying attention. They didn't think it mattered who, who we show on the website, what kind of people, and so on. One of our clients many years ago was Arabia Online. This is different from America Online, no relationship. They had designed their website in English to attract people from Europe and North America to come to Arab countries in the Middle East. The layout of the website was in English. Excuse me, the language of the website was in English, but the layout was in Arabic. The major buttons on the screen are here on the right, and you move to the left as you would in Arabic to get to details. In fact, even the little arrows here point that way as they would in Arabic reading text. The designers just couldn't quite get out of their Arabic culture <clears throat> in creating this design for Westerners in North America and Europe. So we suggested they flip the design at least. If you were to look <clears throat> years ago at maktoub.com, which is one of the, was one of the most popular Arab news websites, portals like Yahoo <clears throat> in uh, Europe or North America, you would have seen many differences, not only of language and the reading direction, but use of colors, use of photographs of people, even the organization of content. In South Africa and India, these are countries with more than one national language. There are approximately 14 national languages in South, I think there are 14, in, no, maybe it's seven in South America and 14 in India. English is not even one of the top languages in, in South Africa, it's uh, Zulu. And <clears throat> in India, people have become accustomed to be more interested in local indigenous heroes for comic books, not Spider-Man imported from America. This, by the way, was the costume of an Indian Spider-Man, <clears throat> which was maybe looking like normal Spider-Man at the top, but more like an Indian man at the bottom. <clears throat> Many co companies have tried to account for different languages and to some extent cultures. Even Apple had a language switcher which had two versions of Switzerland, one for French and one for German, but they would have had to have many buttons for South Africa and India, for example. Even the idea of the weekend, what days are the weekend? I'm sure you would say, Oh, it's obvious, Saturday and Sunday, right? But not all countries celebrate Saturday and Sunday as the weekend. In Israel, it's Friday and Saturday, Saturday the Jewish Sabbath, and Sunday is a work day, just like any other day of the week. In some Muslim countries, <clears throat> especially ones rebuilding their, their countries after war, they were trying to decide well, what, what day shall we have the, the, the weekend? They wanted it to include Friday, which is the Muslim Sabbath day, but they didn't want to have either a Jewish or a Christian day included in the weekend, so they made Thursday and Friday the weekend. Even though most of Europe was busy in finance and doing other things, they still wanted to have their own version of the weekend. Different countries and cultures have strong colors or gentle pale colors. <clears throat> colors for men, colors for women, colors for adults, colors for children that are different from country to country. They're not all the same. Some of the flags of the world represent different color contributions. The ones that are mostly green, like you see here, those are countries strongly influenced by Islam. 
In fact, here's the Saudi flag right here. Cultural preferences exist <coughs> for color, layout, textures, and patterns. <coughs> preferences exist for symmetric or asymmetric balance in compositions. You can try to localize products and services for certain groups. They may be product groups, all the people who buy Nike shoes, or social groups like Japanese housewives or Swedish house husbands. The business challenge is to know what groups shall we bring together that have a certain approach, a certain style, a certain preference for colors or layout or organization of information without too many versions. <clears throat> People have been studying culture well, for thousands of years. But very recently, in the 20th century, since Ruth Benedict published Patterns of Culture in 1939. Do any of you know the name of Edward Hall? A few. He created the uh, science of proxemics, how close we are to other people in social situations. Some people in some cultures like to get very close so that you can spit in each other's faces and smell the garlic on the breath of your partner. <clears throat> other cultures remain very distant. They think that's more polite and more desirable. I'm going to introduce Hofstede's five dimension of culture because it's fairly simple and it's been studied a lot over decades. It has data from 50 countries and has some reputation or some fame. Not everyone agrees with it, but it's a useful way to introduce you to <clears throat> the concept of culture models. He first uh, published something in 1997, later revised in 2005. He was an IBM staff member and was able to interview employees of IBM around the world. And he developed an idea that there are patterns of thinking, feeling, and acting that are programmed into us at a very early age. And that leads to differences of rituals, symbols, heroes and heroines, and values. <coughs> Here are Hofstede's original five dimensions of culture. I'll explain each one. We'll look at a few examples. You can comment on, the, on them at the end. Power distance is the distance between the most powerful people and the least powerful people in a country or culture. Ah, Hofstede said that each country has one culture, one dominant culture in Germany, in France, in the US, in the UK. You can argue about that, but that was the original idea. <clears throat> in high power distance countries, the boss is in charge. Hopefully a benevolent autocrat, a good father, and subordinates do what they're supposed to, to do, what they're told to do. But in low power distance countries, the distance is closer and sometimes people change position of who's in power. And it's okay to argue with the boss. What are implications for high power distance countries and cultures. <clears throat> High power distance countries and cultures would have more structured access, more emphasis on a social or moral order, a focus on expertise, the importance of being authentic, certified, official. When we first looked at uh, this topic and, and e these examples, we looked at Malaysia and the Netherlands. The Malaysia uh, culture was one of the most high power distance cultures in the world at the time. The Netherlands was much lower. When we looked at a university homepage in Malaysia, you can see that this design is very symmetric, like the human body, like all government buildings of power, like the Pope's residence, like the White House, like palaces of kings and queens, <clears throat> whereas in the Netherlands, it was asymmetric. 
Oh, I forgot to mention that if you look at the uh, center, you see the official seal of the university. One of the links even explains the history, so that's important. And the pictures are of the important people on the campus and the important buildings. If you see ordinary people at all, they're very small, they're tiny, not very important. But here, we see a young man and a young woman. Are these the leaders of the campus? Mm, I don't think so. I think they're students. They're people without the most power, <clears throat> but they are the people for whom the university was created. And as I said, it's asymmetric. <clears throat> Over the years, we've studied these websites and others and have seen them change. They do change. They become more modern in, in many ways. <clears throat> but for Malaysian University, we still see an emphasis on men, not women. In the Dutch University websites, we found <clears throat> pictures, in this case, of all, almost all women and one man. So some of these trends, some of these patterns of imagery and behavior and organization continue. The second dimension is individualism versus collectivism. The ties between individuals are loose. In collective cultures, people are born into a group and stay in that group throughout most of their lives. If you have two dimensions, you can make a chart like Hofstede does in his books. Here's the USA at the top, very individualistic. Here are Germany and Finland and others sort of in the center. Way in the collective uh, direction are Costa Rica in low power distance in Israel, high power distance in Singapore or Mexico. One of the points that Hofstede does in his book is to show differences about work, family, and education and how that is affected by these different cultures. So in a work culture, in individual countries, personal time is important, freedom is important. In a collective culture, training, physical condition, and use of skills are more important. In each case, he shows these differences. <coughs> in individualism, there are individual interests, that dominate, a right to privacy that dominates, greater freedom of the press, an ideology of freedom. But in collective cultures, the government dominates the economy and the press. Everyone should have the same opinions. There should be a consensus. It's an ideology of equality and harmony. So what are implications for global UX design? In individual cultures, you might maximize personal achievement, youth, activity, and extreme speech. But in collective societies, controversy would be discouraged. There would be more respect for tradition and more support uh, for uh, uh, social groups. We found examples in the National Park System websites of the United States and Costa Rica. Remember, they were at the top and the bottom of that chart I showed you. <coughs> This particular website is not going to win any awards, or wouldn't have won any awards when it was up, but it was typical of, of an individualistic country. Here's your uh, park system with your sites, uh, places that you can visit. You own the parks. And here's a greeting from one individual, the head of all parks, to you, the visitor. Completely different from Costa Rica at the time, which had a little butterfly flying around. It had beautiful imagery. It had a political slogan, no artificial ingredients. What was most, I, say, I think, strange about this website at the time is that it had a, a link called what's cool or what's hot, what's exciting. And if you clicked on that, what did you get? This announcement that Costa Rica had signed an agreement to protect children and adolescents against sexual exploitation. Is that what you were expecting for what's cool? I don't think so. But in Costa Rica, as part of group 
group think or group support for social action, that was understandable and acceptable. A third dimension <coughs> of culture is gender roles, feminine versus masculine gender roles. Now, Hofstede had in mind the traditional gender roles of men being assertive, competitive, and tough, while women stayed at home, were people-oriented and tender. <coughs> With exceptions in some uh, uh, primate groups and some culture groups around the world, this generally has been the story of civilization for some 10,000 years. Um, it's it's uh, Hofstede's definition that in masculine cultures, uh, masculine and feminine groups are separated, but in feminine cultures they tend to overlap. And you might have uh, roles that are not so distinct and sometimes uh, interchangeable. Interchanging. At the time, one of the most masculine cultures in the world was that of Japan. One of the most feminine was of Sweden. Uh, Arab countries were somewhat in the middle, but they included a wide variety of uh, Middle Eastern countries, including Saudi Arabia and Jordan, which are quite different <coughs> in their moder modernity or orientation to Western values. Gender gaps have been studied around the world for a decade or more. And uh, this is one that shows some of the gender gaps. You can't read them, I suppose. They're too small. Even I can't read them. But the United States is number 23, I think. Canada is number 16. So. The, the role of women, the freedom of women to uh, achieve and move in society differs greatly from country to country, as some of you know well. Um, here is a chart that Hofstede did publish of power distance versus masculinity. Here is Austria, very low power distance. Here is Singapore high. <clears throat> and here are the Scandinavian countries which are more feminine and low power distance. As I mentioned, Hofstede looked at work goals in these cultures. Masculine goals often are uh, achieving greater earnings, greater recognition, advancing in the group, in the organization, facing challenges. While feminine goals often, or objectives, are often about relationships with supervisors, with peers, and with the people who are supervised. An implication for global U UX design is that <clears throat> in masculine cultures, mastery, games, competition would be valued more than artwork, which would be viewed as somewhat utilitarian. In feminine cultures, there might be more exchange, more support, more, emotion, more value to emotion and aesthetic appeal. We looked at the time, at, when we first studied this, at Japan, the US, and Sweden. There was a website called Excite in Japan that was divided in two kinds, one for uh, male viewers, one for female viewers. This is the male website whose central content had to do with buying stocks or buying cars. The feminine site was about buying cosmetics and cooking recipes for food. You might <clears throat> disagree with this approach, but that's the way Japan was when we first started to look. In Sweden, there was only one Excite website, and the Swedes would have thought it strange to divide the website into gender role differences. In the US, somewhat in the middle, there are and were websites mostly for men, mostly for women, and some for both. The fourth dimension of Hofstede is uncertainty avoidance, being afraid of, uh, not fear, but nervous or anxious about things that are not known. And different countries <clears throat> and cultures have a different tolerance for that uncertainty. High uncertainty avoidance cultures tend to seem busy, aggressive. What is different is dangerous, 
and the terms dangerous and dirty are often related. In schools, teachers are expected to be experts and to know everything. People shun ambiguous situations. But in low uncertainty avoidance cultures, it's OK for teachers to not know all the answers, to speak in plain language instead of academic uh, uh, language. And what's different may be curious or funny, not threatening necessarily <clears throat> or uh, dangerous. For global user experience design, high uncertainty avoidance cultures, in theory, would want to have things very simple and clear to carefully encode the meaning so people don't get lost in a website or in navigation. Whereas in low uncertainty avoidance cultures and countries, it's OK to get lost. It's not so threatening. Things can be less controlled. When we first looked at differences of websites, we looked at airline companies. <clears throat> you may not even remember that Sabina was a national airline. And it was um, for Belgium as opposed to British Airways for the UK. The Sabina website was very simple, very clear, only a few links. Don't get worried, don't get nervous. Of course, it is odd that they show the, this little girl hanging on a trapeze by her little hands, and if she slipped, I guess she fell to her death. Isn't that an odd image to have on an air, a national airline website? That I leave for the <clears throat> corporate psychologists to figure out. At any rate, the UK at the time, British Airways, had many more layers of information, many more links to look at. It was more complex. You could get lost, and that was OK. We looked at the sites <coughs> as they changed over time, over years. They did get better design, uh, more sophisticated. Uh, they, all, they both went for blue, gray, and white, uh, and black uh, coloring. But in the center, you still had to book a flight. You had to say how many people, where, you go, where are you going, what are the dates, and so on. But the Sabina Airlines website had far fewer other links all around the screens, whereas the British Airlines site, you can see it runs off the screen. It's way down here. There's more information that might be interesting, could be confusing. <clears throat> In fact, the number of links outside the main booking area was about double in the UK for that of Sabina from Belgium. So you can see that some of these tendencies of design and of culture survive over years uh, in the design of at least websites. The <clears throat> uh, remaining dimension is called long or short term time orientation also called Confucian dynamism. Stable societies, Confucius, uh, as a philosopher said, require unequal relationships. The family is a prototype. People should be virtuous throughout their lives, be patient, persevere, work hard, get skills, get educated, and save money. It's a practice-oriented philosophy. Who is at the top of Confucian societies? China. Willing to wait hmm, another 1,000 years to see if the US survives. After all, China's been around for thousands of years. It can wait. Other countries are not so sure or secure or have such a long time horizon. They change governments much more rapidly. In <clears throat> long-term time orientation, practice is more important than theory. Personal networks are more important. <clears throat> and that coincides with a, a system called Guangxi in China, which is relationship building that takes place all through life. At the time, we looked at Germany and China in the Siemens Corporation, Germany <clears throat> being uh, China being one of the highest of long-term cultures, Germany being much less. 
in the German Siemens at the time, images were oriented to functionality. They were clean, well organized, well structured. The Siemens site in China, probably in Beijing, was using calligraphy, more complex and fuzzy imagery, <clears throat> and calligraphy in multiple uh, directions. We looked at the sites over the years. They tended to change, of course. But you still see in Siemens site from Germany an emphasis on one individual versus a group image in China, where you might see this on the, on the same kind of home page according to the corporate designs. <clears throat> so that the German sites were showing tasks or products, function and mastery. The Chinese sites were showing warm, fuzzy images and people images. I mentioned that there are complaints about Hofstede's model. It's old. It's controversial in some ways. Some people think that the data is too old. It looks at corporate subjects. It doesn't look at farmers. It doesn't look at other kinds of groups of business and uh, general people. I mentioned before that it assumes only one culture per country. <coughs> Some people think the gender roles are very uh, uh, debatable, uh, certainly in the light of uh, today. And some of it seems too stereotypical. Some of that's true. Nevertheless, it has been used in a lot of analyses. I'm going to have to skip over some of this because of the lack of time. You can look uh, for papers, books, publications which have used Hofstede's data and model, as well as some of the other models, to try to analyze what is going on, why are people behaving the way they are, how can, this, how can the culture model be used to help predict behavior? We looked some years ago at um, a number of B2B and B2C websites from the US, Europe, and Asia. We did find patterns of low, low power distance and high power distance and what kind of images are used. <clears throat> Here's an example from a Siemens website. This would be in the very same place uh, but for websites from two different countries, where it said, let's go to the home page. Uh, the Siemens website from the Netherlands would show this person looking right at you, whereas the Malaysian website showed three powerful business people and three mon and the monumental um, Kuala Lumpur, I think, uh, monument uh, uh, buildings <clears throat> in Malaysia. Interestingly, Notice that powerful men and giant uh, monuments was exactly the same kind of imagery that appeared in the Malaysian University website. I think that's just a coincidence, but it shows the power of these concepts, I think, within the society. We even found patterns <coughs> for power distance from the, from the highest power to the least power in countries and cultures. The eight countries with the highest power distance almost always showed a male person in a, a prominent image within the website. There were also patterns for collectivism and individualism. In another study that we did, <clears throat> we tried to find out what are the best dimensions of culture to use when thinking about user experience and design in general. We found at least nine major sources of uh, models we asked experts around the world. We came up with about 29 different dimensions of culture, and the experts said, these are the best. Context, that is uh, um, uh, minimal context or, or large-scale context in communication. Technology development, whether you're for technology or against it, whether you're positive about it or not. Uncertainty avoidance, which we saw earlier. Time perception is like somewhat long-term time orientation. And authority conception, somewhat like power distance high and low. Even the concept of usability itself may be biased culturally because different countries and cultures view usability in different ways. A study was done <clears throat> by a Kai researcher some years ago 
and I'll have to point out the differences here, that for um, uh, Danish versus Chinese users, the Chinese are, are the dark bars, the Danish are the light, there's a big gap here for value appearance, visual appearance and a big gap here for it being fun. In other words, for Chinese consumers, for Chinese users, having a product be fun to use and visually appealing are much more important and part of it being usable. That's different than in Western Europe <clears throat> and in some other countries. People have used eye tracking techniques to find out which cultures view websites in different ways and found differences among Chinese, Korean, and US differences. Uh, basically, in uh, Korea and uh, Taiwan, I believe, um, people move around the websites in a circle before they go into the depth of the content. People in the US tend to read things in a sort of letter five or S shape and then jump right into the content. So there are differences <clears throat> in thinking about culture, about design, and there are tools and techniques that allow people to study this in greater detail. Where do we go from here? <clears throat> well, we may need to think about our development steps that I mentioned at the beginning. We may have to think about the components of user interfaces. Remember metaphors, mental models, navigation, interaction, and appearance, and how all five of those can be influenced by culture. We may have to consider other additional sources of insight besides culture. There are theories about emotional intelligence. There are theories about psychological states. There are many other theories of how people, real people, think and behave and feel. All of this has been sitting right in front of us all these decades that we've been creating computer-based products and services, but very few people in Silicon Valley, very few people in technology centers were giving much attention to that. <clears throat> that is changing. We can't continue in the same way. One of the challenges is to educate business people, educate government leaders, educate professionals in general about the importance of these topics. I've tried to introduce you in the time available, which is limited, uh, to one dimension, <coughs> excuse me, to one theory of culture that is Hofstede's, but again, there are at least nine others, and the information about these uh, theories, these models of culture, are readily available. I hope that you will be interested and moved to study them a little bit in your own work to find ways to measure some of these differences and to create systems which are more human and more humane. Thank you for your time. I always enjoy hearing that. Thank you very much. Only in Chemnitz and maybe Graz, Austria, and a few other places is the sound of rolling thunder <laughs> like that so familiar to me. Thank you for your time. Now we have about a half an hour, right? Uh, for any questions, comments, rebuttals, however you would like to start them. Yes, and, and uh, quickly say your name and Something about what country or culture you're coming from. And, sh and shout to all of those people so they hear.
You, you, you uh, said that very nicely. You see more. You are thinking more. You're seeing things you didn't see before. <clears throat> or um, you're able to, you're able to, to predict. Uh, actually, um, Pia Hunold published a paper which I had to <coughs> fly by there uh, more than 10 or 15 years ago in which she studied she was working for Siemens in Munich and studying how German telephone users l learned to use phones and how Chinese mobile phone users tend to learn phones. And the first thing she did was use Hofstede and maybe a little bit of another model to predict what would we find. And then they interviewed people and studied the people and what did they find? More or less what the theories predicted. In terms of <coughs> German people being much more willing to read a 300 page manual for how to run a radio in a new BMW and change the station. The Chinese would never stand for that. They would simply go and ask their friend who knows better or knows already and say, hey, I just bought this BMW or I have this new phone. Uh, how do I change the station? Or how do I push other buttons on the phone? So there are social and stored knowledge differences within the culture, a trust of the written word, um, a more interest in imagery and in addition to text, etc. And some of those differences <coughs> are predicted by the models and they were shown uh, to be working. So <coughs> there are practical insights that can be used that would affect uh, online help, uh, how much imagery there is in screens, how dense the screens are, whether you rely on some social network to help power knowledge acquisition, etc. Just to name a few things, but you, 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 you posed uh, uh, three excellent uh, topics that all of you, I hope, can think about and hopefully remember. Thank you. Another question or comment? Yes. And where are you coming from, yeah, Chemnitz? I am a uh, Chinese German, and uh, I have a question. You were talking about some. Uh, you were talking about some controversial topics. It, you, you mean in Hofstede, in Hofstede's model? You mean? Yeah. yeah. So I see a danger that if you are at to analyze and you have, you should do a website or company and. <coughs> You are designing your website according to what you see. So I see on a normative level, I feel like a danger to cement some uh, yeah, cultural tendencies. What do you think about it? The fact is that many of the research papers have used not just Hofstede's model, but Shalom Schwartz or some others, and a kind of blend of the theories to help better understand and see the patterns. It's not just a blind trust in any one model, especially since people have disagreed with or even attacked Hofstede's concepts, theories, and dimensions. <clears throat> but it can, as this gentleman was just saying, help you notice more things help you uh, manage and be aware of some of these differences and may in some cases get you close to being able to predict what you'll find, which may save you some time in terms of detailed testing or expensive testing, etc. So they have some value. I, I don't think that they're 100% foolproof. And I believe <clears throat> that people will be continuing to perfect the models and perfect tools even to being able to have 
software-supported changes in the designs based on culture models so that in five years or seven years, if you uh, know that you're intending a product or service for a particular market or group of people or countries or cultures, you would say, oh, I remember these people need more of this rather than that, and all you do is change the knobs and you look as your design changes according to the influence of the culture on every possible detail of the design because it's much more under computer control. You can still have that danger that you just described of being able to lock, lock in and be blindsided and narrow thinking, <coughs> excuse me, but most designers, professional designers, would not trust any one tool or technique or theory or model as being good all the time. Most designers know it's usually much more complex, but it's handy and helpful to be pointed in general directions with general patterns. That's how I would kind of create a balance between <clears throat> being completely devoted as sometimes uh, zealot, zealous, eager new students are or new users of tools and techniques become because they believe this is the one way to do things. I, as a designer, don't believe that. Yes? That's another good question or good point. <clears throat> Many people argue that we're all moving towards a general agreement on how these things should be. My argument, is, my counter argument is that many of us are becoming bicultural. We know how to do things <clears throat> in the world of user interfaces and technology, and when we're done, we turn away from the computer and eat with forks or chopsticks. Because we have our own personal lifelong culture versus this additional, and in some case, for some people, newer version of an international culture of behavior, values, rituals, heroes, and heroines. So <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think that we're all going to become the same, nor will all of these differences be washed away in the final <clears throat> Google's on uh, amalgam of Google and Amazon and Facebook uh, into this one super way of doing things. I have a feeling they're going to break before that. That's just my theory. Yes? Hello, um, I'm Lena, and I'm studying intercultural communication. You're, you're studying? Intercultural communication. Different cultural conversations, did you say? Intercultural communication. Thank you. Intercultural okay. communication. Yeah, Or part of this global culture? International. <coughs> well, do you want to try to give it a. Yeah, maybe something like top two rankings or corporate rankings. For example, I don't know that we all do stuff like this. Is that international? I don't know if it's. I would use some examples like 
<clears throat> it may seem too trivial and simple, but even the notion of shopping carts, shopping baskets, which many people know from having to buy things through national or global websites, require payments, require gathering things together that we want to buy, and, um, and create <coughs> baskets in which we temporarily store things, and then we make final decisions about what we want, and uh, even to the notion of points and incentives related to our purchases. Those are <clears throat> marketing, economy, capitalism, um, techniques and habits that have grown and spread worldwide. So that now in China, as you may know, on uh, I think it's uh, the 11th of November each year. That's uh, National Singles Day, 11-11. It's the largest shopping experience on earth in 24 hours. More money changes hands than anywhere else on earth because all the singles are buying friend, uh, their friends' uh, presents and exchanging goods. And a huge <clears throat> set of rituals and activities has grown around that particular version of the shopping experience. So that, that's one example, but you can, you can um, find other examples in terms of ways of communicating uh, in telecommunications, group discussions versus single discussions, uh, maybe you mentioned it just now, but this is also a very powerful thing in Chinese culture, rating things, rating everything. What's the most popular color? What's the most popular kind of sweater to buy? Who's got the most popular shoes? Who's selling the most popular uh, musical uh, CDs or, or streaming uh, music? All of that, <clears throat> all of those elements are part of social rituals have, which have spread around the world. And you see them really magnified in China. That, those are some examples. I thought you said at the beginning, intercultural conversations, which is somewhat like communications. And the reason I heard that is because <clears throat> this lecture is part of a tutorial about cross-cultural communication that I'll be giving next July in Orlando, Florida at my conference called Design User Experience and Usability. And I'll send you information about that in case you want to put together a session or paper uh, or a tutorial. Um, <clears throat> but in that tutorial, I give examples of cross-cultural conversations that take place all the time in the business world, among family members who come from different countries. And people can be talking like this and not really communicating because there are such differences of intentions, motivations, techniques for communication, social assumptions, etc., that occur all the time and in the business world can lead to big problems. Thank you for that comment. Uh, we have still a few more minutes. Any other? And by the way, be sure to uh, give me your email address, you know, so I can follow up later. Yes. Yeah, I know. Oh, great. Okay. Salam alaikum. Um, <clears throat> you have just raised <laughs> a very powerful question and, and challenge which many people are facing. I mentioned uh, maktub.com uh, versus Yahoo and even how they would 
categorize the news. What information falls into sports? What information falls into politics? What information falls into entertainment? And so on. If you look <clears throat> even at the classical newspapers in Germany, in, in the US, in the UK, uh, and certainly I would assume in Egypt, uh, you would find very different page structures and organization of the news. And <clears throat> if you now ask, how can we change the mental model of one group into another? All I can say is, <clears throat> that's a very good question. I think that there are people trying to do that and people themselves who go from one country to another, one culture to another, do in fact make that kind of transition. They remember the old way, uh, but they now have learned the new way. Frankly, I felt that way when I left Eudora email and had to learn Apple's mail program because I thought I was going to go crazy from the change of mental models of just two mail applications. <clears throat> when you change from, from, from Apple iPhone to Google Android, you are changing significant mental models. And for a while, <clears throat> it's very difficult, very different, very challenging, and to some extent, you are crippled or you are confused and unable to make progress for a while until you get used to the new mental model. I'll tell you another personal, I'll try to come back to you too, uh, another personal experience was when I went from physics to art school. One semester, I had been studying quantum electromagnetic theory, and the next semester, I was cutting out little pieces of colored paper and gluing them to another sheet of paper. And when people in the art and design school said, oh, that's cool, that works, I thought, what, what are they talking about? What is it that's supposed to be working? It took me about half an academic year to understand what people were talking about and to develop a mental model for myself of what this new world and discipline of visual communication, visual design, graphic design, visual arts, etc., was all about, which I had been personally interested in all my life, but was now learning as a professional with categories, terminology, hierarchies, history, heroes and heroines, rituals and values, the very terms I said right at the beginning. It took me about six months. When people, I've heard today of a young woman, uh, nine or 10 years old, having to go from Germany to a US school system and suddenly have to speak English and know how to behave in an American school versus a German school. It took quite a while to be able to make that transition. But it can be accomplished, and those of you who have gone from one culture to another know that it can be done. Yeah, my question was really based upon the people are actually moving frequently, much more frequently, even uh, on the on the on the various space or even on the net. So uh everyone's building his own uh mental model and we can we can uh can impart and influence. Well, the the the, the best suggestion is Try going to another country and culture, if you can. But you know, not everyone can do that. Not everyone can afford that. Uh, not everyone does that. <clears throat> but it is one of the best ways to appreciate the differences of culture, the differences of mental models. <clears throat> I, I reference in some of my publications to a study by Chung and Selvandi, where they gave uh, computer science students from China and the US the concept of home, what, what are the rooms of your home, and what things do you put into those rooms, like kitchen, bathroom, 
dining room, living room. The Chinese version is different than the US version. And if you give Chinese students the US mental model, they get confused, they make mistakes, they can't even operate. And the same thing for US students. <clears throat> People get used to their mental models, we all do, and that needs to be understood, respected, or accounted for if you're going to try to change it. And changing it requires a lot of effort. We actually were involved with that in 1994 to 1997, trying to get travel agents around the world used to a graphical user interface for travel booking, which may seem rather mundane, but at that time, Sabre, which was one of the systems used by one third of the world's travel agents, was undergoing <clears throat> a revolutionary change and we were helping to create the new user interface for that. We had to get travel agents to change their habits around the world to accommodate the new capabilities of a graphical user interface. Yes. Cultural theory? Uh, experience. Yes. Uh, stuff we go on, like all the papers, we have something to separate. We have something that is incorporated, we can't change, and nobody can explain why the norms are there, basically. And then there are much things we can go on to make a change in the culture. And I think it's today that this international culture gives everybody some, some basics. <coughs> the, the, the challenge with Hofstede's model is that a, a country like France, which used to be white Roman Catholics, now has the largest percentage of Muslim, Muslim citizens of any European nation. It's not a pure monocultural country. And that's, I mean, that's been true from the beginning for the U.S. It's more true from some, for some countries than other countries. And countries are trying to cope with the notion of our, even our self-identity changing and the, the mental models that go along with that changing in some cases rapidly. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank you for some very good questions. I don't know where the little piece of paper is floating around somewhere. OK, good. Um, I'll be happy to stick around for a few minutes to uh, ask, answer more questions if I can. But I want to thank you for your attention. I've enjoyed talking with you and to you, and hope we can continue the conversation in some way in the future. Vielen Dank. Just before, every, just before everyone is leaving, you have a microphone. Just before everyone is leaving, um, thank you very much, Aaron, for being recorded to me. And uh, thank you for everyone for showing up for this lecture and a very short, warm introduction. And we have another talk on Thursday.